relational graph management, from, but from the perspective of Anchor Buoy. Okay, what is this session about? Okay, it's about relational graph management, including the tables and table occurrences we have, and conventions around them, which is real important, and some related tips and tricks. The person who gets acknowledgement for actually um, coming up with the idea is uh, Roger Jakes, second from the top here. So he's the one who put the conventions around it, gave it the name, um, put some strong conventions around it, and you know, worked for Salian. And uh, I recognize him as the one who's made it uh, rich, thorough, and popular, and, and brought it out in the open. Although he, he at the same time, there's at least a half a dozen people doing it. So why do you want to know Anchor Buoy? Well, because there is a need for a logical approach to, to taming the relational graph, and there are a number of approaches out there. You know, we talk a little about recall engineers, come up with some multiple ideas. But the bottom line is you want something that's consistent, dependable, intuitive, easy, not only to follow, but to remember, and to reduce cognitive overload on the developer. Mm -hmm. right? And to make collaboration a fluid um, thing. The cognitive overload is the big thing. I argue that with Anchor Buoy and the naming conventions that I'll go into probably on the second half of the session, that you can get it down so concise that you never once the system is built and you're working in the system regularly and you've got your legend going, you can have this so memorized you never go into the graph to check out what the relationships are. Whatever context you're in, you could just start typing the keys and the underscores and, and call the names of the fields because you've had an entire thing memorized. Relevance and relationship are going to become almost synonymous in Anchor Buoy where they're not in almost any other system. We want to provide an intuitive sense of context always, so no matter where you are in the system or what you're doing in the system or what dialog box or what layout or anything you're doing, the context will always be consistent. And then the big one, really, the big ultimate one is that you want it to make sense in scrolling lists. So when you're pulling a list of fields and you want to assign something to a, to a screen or when you're dropping a field in a layout, you want to know that the fields at the top are the ones that you can use and the ones down below or not. It should be intuitive so you don't have to hunt for them. They should be gathered for you. Reducing errors in development seems to be real important because if you have a convention that's not consistent and doesn't make sense and you're talking to the wrong table and you're getting the wrong found set and the wrong results and pulling the wrong IDs, then how useful is that whole system to you? And you could run into trouble. Each layout is tied to one table occurrence, not a table. One table has many table occurrences. And each table occurrence has one table occurrence group. And there may be many layouts tied to one table occurrence. Where am I starting from? The whole idea of context in the table, uh, in the relational graph is where am I? Or when I'm working on a layout, where am I? What can I see from where I'm at? Where am I going? And can I get down from here? What's the path? And when it gets as squirrely as that kind of thing, how many people have started out with charts? At one point you had something like this. Anybody? Nobody's going to raise their hand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So if I'm in that table down here and I want to get up here, I have to find a path. Well, thankfully there's a straight path in this case, but that may not always be the case. It could get very difficult. That was where the developer does certain basic things. It's where you create table occurrences and join them, such as here. We have two table occurrence groups that you can see are discrete ones here being currently highlighted are one particular uh, talk. It's also a place where annotation or comments about the table occurrences in the groups is kept. So here's, you're seeing where I have taken the, uh, the comments blocks available with the alpha key there and colored them and put them behind the table occurrence groups to make it clear that it's a group. Here it's uh, not real clear, but it gets very clear when I use colored blocks to highlight them or shrinking them up and putting them up above the table occurrence groups and using these as breakers. I find this more useful than shrinking it up. So if we're going to choose a relational graph method, we want then one that's going to give meaning to the available relationships under all conditions that's intuitive, no matter what the context is. Minimize the need to, release, to reference the graph so you can keep it in your head and not have cognitive overload and having to, to rush back and forth to look at the graph to remember what you're doing or have it documented on paper. For it always to make sense in scrolling lists and to reduce errors that you might make in developing by getting the wrong data. But what you really want to have is where all related data is also relevant data. Those are two key words to the concept here. The basics of Anchor Buoy is that it is layout. it's a layout-centric approach to working with the graph. So it's keeping in mind as you're building the graph how you're going to use it in context of specific layouts. It simplifies it 
partly by reducing the bidirectionality and using uh, unidirectional relationships. It simplifies it with naming conventions as well. It really pushes for one direction outward, generally from the left to the right. And even Roger Jacques came up with the idea, as at least it's recognized. And in Anchor Buoy, table occurrences are manageable in scrolling lists because it provides that relevance to relative data. Each table occurrence is one anchor. So there's a table occurrence group. Okay? There's an anchor on the left. And generally, there's only one anchor per base table in the relation of graph. In the entire graph, in pure anchor buoy, if there were such a thing, the context table, called CON, will only exist as an anchor in one table occurrence group for the entire graph. And it's generally on the left. And then buoys are generally on the right. So here's a couple of buoys on the right. right. Each anchor may have any, any number of buoys. And buoys may have buoys off of them. They provide almost being an anchor for continuing buoys. So the, the strings can go out and limit it. It's not one deep. I'm just doing that for presentation purposes. But they would continue to go further off the right, and they're all eventually tied back to this one anchor. So it divides the table occurrences into groups that do not touch each other, and pure anchor buoy they won't touch. So here's two table occurrence groups. That's a tog. That's a tog. And uh, never the two shall meet. Okay? They shall never have relationships between them. It keeps it very simple. You may have a lot of togs. You may have redundancy. You may see uh, a table. Let's go back here. This is an anchor, the company table here. This is an anchor in this talk, the context table. So the context table shows up again here. The company table shows up again here. We're using color in this uh, example to show you the same t uh, base table. So everything blue is, is context, is up this company. Everything lavender is context, everything green is foam. So they may show up as buoys multiple times, and something that's an anchor in one talk may show up as a buoy in another. It may even show up as a, as a buoy in its own talk. When it gets an anchor itself, that can happen as well. Layouts are always going to be based only on the anchors. And portals are always going to be based on related data, which could be any one of these buoys you see here. All related data and portals are going to be based on buoys. And here you see the blue arrows showing buoys on the right. That's where all your portals are going to be related. Portal will never display data on an anchor but it will always be based on an anchor showing related data to the movies. When you're doing your business analysis and you're figuring out your structure and your data modeling and your data normalization and what the business rules are, I will come up with a list of different fundamental layouts that I'm going to need and relationships I'm going to need and I'm going to build them up front as much as possible so that when I actually go to start building scripts and layouts, I've got them all available. I pre-analyze that. So about 80% of all relationships and table occurrences I'm ever going to need are going to be built up front before I ever actually build any user interface based layouts. I went from company to contacts and this relationship is based on the foreign key of the company that sits in the contact table. Pretty simple, right? This is not abbreviated. I'm going to company to contact ID company. Very easy to understand what you're doing. To do it accurately, company to company invoice by ID company. Company to invoice by ID company invoice item by ID invoice. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Company to invoice by ID company to invoice item by ID invoice to product by ID product. If you are on a portal of company looking at related records for the context for the company, related, related set, and you wanted to go look at a particular record in the portal for contacts on a layout based on contacts, you would navigate an anchor buoy from here using the GTRR function, which we'll demonstrate in the slide, to the portal. Go to related records here, and then the pull-down menu will say using what layout you would you would make the destination a layout that is an anchor for the contacts table. Thank you very much.